What's going on, everybody? Welcome to Fraternity, the best horror podcast on the internet. I'm your little brother, Danny, your host, and I'm here with my big brother, my wonderful big brother, Sean. The devil is in all of you. (laughs) How's everybody doing tonight? (laughs) So we're going to be talking about a movie about devils, I assume, or uh, of satanic nature. Well, let me put it this way. It's cold, man. It's the last week of January. It's cold. And we're going to do a movie that's going to warm your ass. <laughs> warm it. Stick some needles in it. Some nails. All that. Oh, yeah. So, as we've mentioned many times before, I'm the lifelong horror fan. And Danny is not. And that's okay, Danny. I'm trying to be. I wonder how many horror films is it going to take for me to be a certified uh, a lifelong horror fan? Well, is there a number? Is, is, do I have to wait for you to christen me? Certify me? I'm waiting on my card. <laughs> we are on episode 20 of Fraternity Now, so I'll say you're getting close. Because we've covered some truly amazing works of horror cinema. With that said, There are still realms of horror that are probably best traveled with a bit more experience under your belt. But Danny, your journey through horror is being expedited. But I definitely think you're ready to tackle this fantastic German witch hunt exploitation film from 1970. A film that had one of the best marketing campaigns. They called it positively the most horrifying film ever made guaranteed to upset your stomach the first film to be rated v for violence and they even handed out barf bags to moviegoers so would you like to tell our listeners what movie we're talking about we're going to be talking about the 1970 german horror film mark of the devil we sure are and you know our first two episodes of the season you had seen the films before But I feel like we're really getting back to what we're all about here at Fraternity. Because I have to ask, I know you didn't see it, but had you even heard of this movie? Never heard of it. Didn't know what it was about. But I'm honored that you think I'm ready to take on such a film, Sean. I really am. (laughs) Well, I have to admit that this is a movie that I didn't watch until fairly recently. I did encounter it in my teen years. But I never made that real effort to see it. I remember I would always notice it in this video store in the mall called Suncoast. And I would pick it up and I would check it out. I remember a lot of the imagery from back then. And I think that's why it always stuck in my mind. You had the accused in this cage on the cover. The girl on the rack on the back of the box. There's the image that most people will remember with the girl in the device to hold her in place as they rip out her tongue. Some really horrifying and unforgettable imagery accompanies this film, even when you haven't seen it. So I would pick it up and look at it, but I was always hesitant. As we know, marketing can sometimes be deceiving. Plus, this was an older film, so I had a sense that Perhaps the shock value had already faded with the passing of time. I just had a nagging feeling that I wouldn't like it. So there were a few occasions where I had the film in my hand, but I would end up putting it back for something else or just talk myself out of it. I'm kind of glad that I put this film off, though, because I don't think I would have appreciated it nearly as much then as I did when I finally did pick it up. It wouldn't be until around... 2013 or 2014 that I got this movie. This was when all of the media stores were starting to shut down. They had this massive FYE in Baton Rouge that I would travel to from time to time. This was when I first started to collect Scream Factory titles. Most of my film purchases had migrated to the internet, but FYE would carry some films, and I always appreciated that physical hunt. As I browsed the films, I noticed the first few Arrow video releases for America were mixed in. And one of their first releases was Mark of the Devil. I put off getting it the first time I saw it because I wasn't sure I was ready to add another niche label to my film collecting habits. 
It wasn't until Arrow Video released their limited edition of Society that I had to take the plunge. And when I did, I decided it was about time that I finally got around to seeing Mark of the Devil. So I grabbed it, but it would be a couple more years before I got around to watching it. As most collectors know, we tend to inundate ourselves with films as we add them to our collection. And you can't help but have movies fall through the cracks. So, it wasn't until 2015 or 2016 when I finally did see this film. And I must confess that it was worth the wait. I really enjoyed it then. I still enjoy it now. And I can't wait to hear what you think about it. I just hope you don't think the wrong thing. Because we'll have to pull your tongue out by the roots if you do. And may God have mercy on your soul. I I swear I'm not a witch. I swear I'm not a witch. (laughs) (laughs) well if everyone has their barf bags ready we can hop right in to mark of the devil but before that hey you yeah you listen i know you have a twitter and if you have a twitter why don't you go follow at fraternity keep up to date with everything we're doing you can dm us add us just say hi we'd love to hear from you and hey we have a youtube channel if you go over to youtube You type in Fraternity, and our channel is going to show up. And we're uploading previous episodes over there on YouTube with a little bit of a visual treat. So you're just going to have to go and find out what that is. And if you're a boomer and your primary source of communication is through email, we have an email too, just for you. Fraternity at gmail.com. That's fraternity at gmail.com. Send us questions, comments, anything you like. We'll read you on the show and, and we'll respond. We open with a caravan raid that ends with the raping and killing of nuns. And nothing screams exploitation more than opening your film with such a sacrilegious sequence. (laughs) Accompanied by some uh, beautiful music, I might add. Yeah, I enjoyed the soundtrack. (laughs) (laughs) This film definitely earns the exploitation label. But I do think the movie deserves more credit than just that, because for one, it's a well-made film. And it's also a great story that features timeless themes like faith, politics, power, and injustice. It does play fast and loose with the facts, as we see in The Crawl. And this is our second movie in a row with a crawl, Danny. I love crawls. I love this one. It's just abrupt. (laughs) And I love yeah. the, bur- the burning of the hexen letters in the background while the crawl is going on. It's awesome. Now, we aren't historians. We aren't here to argue historical facts or discuss witch trials and fair real world consequences. But it's claimed that 8 million people were killed in this dark era of humanity is a bit of a stretch. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm not too sure about that gigantic number, but... Uh... Let's leave well enough alone. Before the crawl, we got to see our first witch burning in the town square. And we see a monk get four of his fingers chopped off before getting tarred and feathered and chased out of town by a mob of onlookers. Now for your baptism in tar. Wash his hair. We meet this real weasel of a man who is the advocate to the local witch finder. He's the one who delivers the great, the devil is in all of you line. And... The local witch finder is a real nasty dude named Albino. And we actually saw him earlier orchestrating the attack on that carriage full of nuns. So it's our first glimpse of corruption, I'd say. Yeah, Albino is, uh, we're going to learn, a pretty bad dude who's using his position of power for his own means, basically, as this local witch hunter for this town. Yeah, we watch as Albino lights a fire under two women accused of being witches. And when people usually think of someone being burned alive, you think of them engulfed in flames. But here we see the women suspended above the flames, and that just seems far more cruel if you ask me. Yeah, they're like uh, open roasting these women. Yeah, I think it definitely gives new meaning or understanding to the concept of being burned alive. Because we watch these poor women slowly burn before being lowered into the fire in this horrific public spectacle. A spectacle I think we'd still do if we didn't have cable television. (laughs) (laughs) 
So one of the people at the witch burning is a busty barmaid named Vanessa. And we follow her back to the inn where she works. And we meet a man named Christian Fenmaru, the apprentice of the witch hunter Lord Cumberland. Also present is Cumberland's executioner, Jeff Wilkins. And they await the arrival of Albino. And once he arrives, they inform him that the days of the local witch finder are over and he is to report to Lord Cumberland upon his arrival. What we basically have here is a federal takeover of the local witch hunting trade. And as we see through Albino's ire, being a witch finder is quite beneficial in regards to power as he exclaims, I am the witch finder in this town. Me, Albino. <laughs> Yeah, Albino has such a way with words, and he just, he looks like a witch or a warlock, you know? He's got this very gaunt face. <laughs> and a habit of speaking about himself in the third person. Love it. They inform Albino that they want to see his reports and documents of his activities. And before they leave, Albino notices the gaze of Christian fall upon Victoria. So it sets up a bit of a love triangle jealousy aspect here. We then get a scene of Albino informing his advocate that they need documentation in regards to indictments and confessions. And the advocate informs him that they don't have any such documents and have never got confessions out of anyone. They've been running a pretty crummy and corrupt operation here because they have plenty of executions and no paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Albino is asking his advocate to uh, forge all these documents that christian is asking for later that night albino comes onto vanessa in the kitchen area of the inn and she refuses his advances forcefully and he threatens her with accusations and this scuffle ensues and she ends up stabbing him in the face it's more of like a slash across the cheek <laughs> he gets this uh pretty gnarly cut it suits him he looks he looks he rocks it <laughs> yeah yeah he looks cooler now huh <laughs> the, <laughs> the evil albino the witch hunter vanessa flees albino but he calls out for some men to seize the witch and we then watch as he abuses his power by accusing her she's ridden to the sabbath she threw the holy cross in manure so that the men will become impotent a word we'll hear more about <laughs> and all the while no one at the inn is willing to step in to help in any way which just shows how these power abuses just have everyone unwilling to put themselves at any risk. Right, yeah, it's an interesting aspect because we even hear townsfolk talking about Albino and they hear Cumberland is coming. They say Cumberland has a pretty brutal reputation. Yeah, they know everything going on in this town is wrong, but no one has the will to uh, stand up against it. Yeah, I like in this first half of the film when we can overhear townspeople talking like there's a guy at the witch burning who's like soon there won't be anyone here <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's not wrong it seems like these uh, witch burnings are uh, everyday occurrence yeah you even overhear the guys who are like oh we're gonna miss the show and the guy's like don't worry there will be more <laughs> <laughs> so albino is poking vanessa in the back with this I think he's placing the mark of the devil on her. It's like this corrupt tool they use to stab you. And then they're like, oh, there's the mark of the devil on you. But we see Christian and Jeff Wilkins arrive with the advocate. And Christian demands to see Vanessa's indictment. And when Albino says the advocate has it, Jeff Wilkins backhands Albino and calls him a liar. They discovered the advocate and caught him in the act of that forgery. And so Christian takes Vanessa and orders Jeff Wilkins to carry out ten lashes to remind Albino he serves God and not his own desire. And we get a great bit where Jeff Wilkins just whips the shit out of Albino, knocking him <laughs> all around the inn. Yeah, it's great. We get a taste uh, for Jeff Wilkins' uh, desire for blood here, as he seems to be enjoying it a little bit, lashing Albino. He whipped him right across the face. <laughs> <laughs> Next, we get some relationship building between Vanessa and Christian. And it starts with this adorable dinner scene in the castle. And we're going to learn that Christian is very devout, very noble, but quite naive. He actually lives to serve God. He's one of the powerless in this scenario. And he's actually guided by his faith. But 
He doesn't see the corruption all around him. Yeah, Christian is the one man in this movie who doesn't use his power to corrupt other people. He doesn't use it against people. He truly believes in serving God, but he's just a bit misguided in his mission. Yeah, there's a great bit where Vanessa tells him, you're the first person that has opposed albino. And Christian's like, I haven't opposed albino. I've opposed injustice. Yeah, so Christian, very noble guy, wants to serve God, but he's starting to get some feelings for Vanessa here at this flirtatious dinner scene. I really love when Vanessa is like copying all the same movements as uh, Christian. Like he grabs a piece of fruit and Vanessa grabs a piece of fruit. <laughs> she's just so enamored with him here. <laughs> yeah, it's adorable. And we learned that Vanessa is a very free spirit, which is quite uncomfortable for Christian as things progress here because she says things openly that place a burden on Christian's mind as he's very attracted to her and he does care for her. But she consistently raises questions and doubts on his devotion. Even at dinner, she questions him on if her mother sat accused, how would he respond to that? Yeah, Vanessa here is planting those seeds for Christian to later reflect on uh, what he's done with his life and if what he's following through Cumberland's teachings is really the way. But for now, Christian is uh, devout in his in becoming a witch hunter. Yeah, we spend a couple of days with the two of them at the castle before Lord Cumberland arrives. And we do get a brief bit where Albino tells his advocate to draw up an indictment on Vanessa so that he can present it to Lord Cumberland upon his arrival. He's clearly still miffed about that ass whooping and that gnarly gash he now has on his cheek. But dude, I say go with it. It looks good. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if fear is what you want, a scar is the way to go. We're about 30 minutes in. And now we get the arrival of Lord Cumberland. We get quite a grand entrance for his character. We can see all of the soldiers at the castle are kind of in awe of this larger-than-life figure. And there's this nice long shot that just follows him through the halls of the castle. And finally, Jeff Wilkins greets him. And it's almost time for us to get to some trials. But not before we see Vanessa get cornered in the stables and whipped by an enraged and scorned and scarred albino. I like he says, Let's see how you dance for the devil. <laughs> yeah, I really love the scene when Lord Cumberland arrives. Clearly all the men there have a deep respect for him and it's just tracking his every movement, but we don't see his face yet. And it's just, uh, it makes him very uh, alluring and mysterious. Yeah, we get our first look at Lord Cumberland at the sentencing we witness next. And interestingly... The first girl brought before the Lord is released after Wilkins is like, I couldn't find the devil's mark, my Lord. <laughs> I did look. <laughs> it almost gives us this sense of compassion and fairness that over the next hour will be revealed as an illusion, basically. <laughs> yeah, the next woman isn't nearly as lucky. She has these battered and blackened and bloody hands and arms. She just wears a defeated look on her face. And as the indictment is read, the young woman interrupts and informs Cumberland that she was expelled from the priory after being raped by the Lord Bishop and bearing his child. I think it's safe to assume in the context of this film that she's telling the truth, right? Yeah, she's telling the truth. The last thing these corrupt men are going to do is allow the reputation of a Lord Bishop to be soiled by accusations. So it's off to the torture chamber for her to be stretched on the rack and have her tongue torn from her head by the roots for such blasphemous statements. We then see Vanessa brought before this court, and Christian feigns ignorance, and this is like his only abuse of power here when he says he can't find the indictment. He's lying. <laughs> yeah, I don't think Christian is wrong for doing what he does. It's just an example of if he's capable of doing that, we can only imagine the shit Lord Cumberland probably does. <laughs> Yeah, Christian had his best intentions, but uh, it doesn't uh, exactly work here. We do get a great moment with Cumberland when the advocate speaks of the charges against Vanessa. Cumberland is pouring himself a glass of wine when the advocate mentions impotence, and this causes Cumberland to make his cup runneth over. <laughs> <laughs> his eyes bug out. <laughs> yeah, so this uh, 
we can assume this uh, claim of impotence hits a little close to home for Cumberland. Most definitely. And the charges are sufficient. <laughs> <laughs> Vanessa is in a cell now. Yeah, where she will remain for the majority of the movie now. We then get a brief scene of Christian and Cumberland taking a stroll outside the castle where they discuss Vanessa. And there's little doubt in Christian's mind that Vanessa stands falsely accused. But we see that Cumberland plans to prove otherwise as he tells Christian, She's a witch. A beautiful girl, I grant you, but a witch. She will confess. You'll <laughs> see. And who wouldn't after the shit they do to you? <laughs> We also see a young Baron arrive, and he's being placed in the care of Lord Cumberland under the suspicion of possession. And the Baron speaks of these accusations being a plot against him by the Lord Bishops in order to force him to forfeit his land and possessions to the church. And this sets Christian off because he still believes no man of God could be capable of performing <laughs> such deeds. As we will see, though... This is definitely exactly what is going on with the poor young Baron. A man of God would do a lot, <laughs> as we will see soon. Yeah, because, Danny, are you ready for some torture scenes? <laughs> I'm ready for some uh, finger crushing. No! <laughs> well, we're almost halfway through the film, so it's about time. Now... Remember what I said about wondering if this film had possibly lost its shock value when I was young? Mm -hmm. I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I think these scenes of torture are just as shocking now as they were back then. What did you think? I think they're effective. I don't know if I would say they're as shocking as they would have been back then. But there are some torture scenes here that do get to me. And this finger crushing that we see is one of them because we see them putting the poor young woman's fingers in this vice and crushing them. And that alone is enough. But we get this like blood splatter come from her thumb when it's getting crushed. And it's just like, oh, no, like that's <laughs> that's a little far. You know, it makes you wince. You don't expect it. You're like, oh, <laughs> Oh yeah, really disgusting stuff. And this device is a torture device known as the thumbscrew. The finger crusher. Oh, and really effective audio too, as you can hear them tightening the thumbscrews on her, and you even see Jeff Wilkins like straining to get it tighter. <laughs> I'm sure it's not easy to get a human thumb to pop like a grape. <laughs> <laughs> We see the prison guards are beating up the young Baron, and Christian and Lord Cumberland walk in, and Cumberland points out how the soldiers revel in seeing a wealthy Baron reduced to nothingness. And once the Baron's brought back to his cell, he visits him there, and tries to convince him to give his earthly possessions to the church. It's so plain to see the corruption and greed at work here. <laughs> yeah, but the young Baron refuses, spits at Cumberland's face, and then Cumberland... He just rises and says, makes no difference. If the Baron dies, the money's going to be passed to the church anyway. So it's <laughs> right. just this ad admission of like, we're going to get this money one way or the other. Yeah, I like how all the while Vanessa is watching from her cell. I thought it was a good touch. We then see the young woman who got her fingers crushed again. Hey, speaking of, uh, you want to talk about sound design, the young woman getting stretched. This does look less painful than the finger crushing, but I'm sure it's excruciatingly painful. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, imagine if someone grabbed your arms, another person grabbed your legs, and were just pulling with all their might. I don't want to. <laughs> I saw the movie. That was enough. <laughs> we then see Jeff Wilkins use a hot iron brand on the bottom of one of her feet. Now that looks fucking painful, dude. Oh, yeah. Yeah, she's literally getting branded here. <laughs> it's at this point, too, where the woman will basically tell them whatever they want to hear. We then cut away from this gratuitous violence, though, to some random sex between two people we haven't even seen in the movie yet. Kind of a <laughs> jarring transition. Yeah, a little abrupt. The young naked woman goes to look out of the window, and Albino, the advocate, and two of their thugs happen to notice. So of course they go up to stick their noses in that business. 
And when a struggle ensues, the man ends up being stabbed by one of Albino's thugs. This causes the advocate to flee the scene. And next time we see him, he reports this occurrence to Cumberland. Because it's his duty as a Christian, after all. <laughs> uh, the advocate is such a sleazeball. Of all the sleaziness in this film, he's up there. <laughs> he just looks so ratty, don't he? He does. He looks, yeah, he just looks like a snitch. He's got the snitch look. Before he snitched, though, we saw the young Baron get his first taste of torture. We also see Lord Cumberland cross paths with Vanessa in her cell. And they have a standoff where Cumberland tells her, I know what you are. And she's like, and I know what you are. Yeah, Vanessa sees through all this bullshit. We then see the young Baron get stripped of his trousers and plopped down bare ass on a bed of nails. <laughs> He's got a bad case of bloody bottom. And then they put his feet in some stocks and proceed to cane the bottom of his feet. Ugh. So much feet torture. And then you think they gotta, wa they gotta walk on their feet after that. <laughs> well, they're mostly being dragged from torture device to torture device. <laughs> Is it just me or were people back then far too creative in regards to pain? When you're trying to get a confession that isn't there, you gotta get creative, So I guess. <laughs> this is what happens when you have too much time on your hands. Get a hobby, people. <laughs> Thank God for uh, daytime television and sports. <laughs> <laughs> we then get to one of the more famous, or perhaps notorious, scenes from the film. As they strap the woman from before in some contraption to hold her in place as they rip her tongue from her head. Pretty gruesome stuff here. We must never weaken in performing God's work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you see, you see Christian is like visibly, he's like turning away as they're ripping her tongue out and Cumberland is trying to assure him, you know, for those who turn against our savior, no punishment is sufficient. <laughs> the Lord's work is never easy. <laughs> when they leave, they cross paths with Vanessa, who pleads her case with Christian. But unfortunately, he proves here that at this point, He's still just a blind follower of Lord Cumberland's. She even asks to herself once he leaves, like, can you only see through his eyes? I love that line. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, Vanessa calls Christian out here for just blindly following everything that Cumberland does. We get some scenes here of Christian and Lord Cumberland having discussions that do reveal the cracks forming in Christian's faith, though. And Lord Cumberland does his best at caulking those cracks with his bullshit that he passes off as wisdom. And due to the murder of the young man we saw having sex, Cumberland has summoned Albino to the castle. And we see him arrive here. And it's here that a great deal of truths come spilling out, because Cumberland strips Albino of his power and duties. And Albino doesn't take kindly to this. He explains that he may, I may not be a smart man, but <laughs> I know what witch hunting really is. <laughs> Yeah, Albino is just calling out Cumberland here and basically saying, like, you and I are the same. You know, I know why you have the young Baron here. You're trying to get his money. I can see it. You know, the only difference here is that Albino fully admits to what he does. Cumberland, on the other hand, has this facade of being a man of God. Yeah, and once you've seen behind the curtain, you can't buy into the bullshit, right? <laughs> Yeah, I like when Albino tells him, you're just a man, like me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Albino is really trying to put Cumberland down on his level. Perturbed and unwilling to drop the act, though, Lord Cumberland goes to search for a guard, and he tells Albino, I can have you hanged. Because that's how these people deal with problems. They just <laughs> torture and kill you. <laughs> I'll kill you. <laughs> And Albino tells the Lord, you may kill me, but before you do, I'll make you the laughing stock of the country. But it isn't until that pesky word of impotence is uttered that Lord Cumberland is set into a rage. Yeah, almost immediately, Cumberland begins to choke Albino, and we get some awesome point of view shots from both perspectives as we see Cumberland's uh, angry face as he's choking. Albino here. Yeah, like he smashes Albino's head up against this heavy wall decor and it crashes to the floor and is like spinning and making this sound as both men fall to the floor and Cumberland keeps choking him. 
And eventually Lord Cumberland rises up and he's telling Albino, you're no witch finder, you're dirt. <laughs> but it's here that Cumberland realizes Albino is no longer living. He just murdered this man inside the castle. And to make matters worse, Christian saw the whole thing. This really puts a damper on Christian's faith because it's only the first commandment, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, no coming back from that. Yeah, Christian runs off with his arms flailing like a little gimp and goes and cries in his bedroom. <laughs> He's upset. His faith is being tested, Sean. <laughs> and Lord Cumberland just decides to become the ultimate douchebag dickhead <laughs> at this point. We see he orders the burial of Albino's corpse. He finally sentences that poor woman to burn, which is a godsend. Hallelujah. Kill this woman, please. <laughs> we see her hung above the flames and lowered upon them. And it's sad and it's tragic, but I'd say there's definitely a bit of relief on her face. Yeah. I mean, she even says earlier that she she was grateful that they were going to stop torturing her and finally let her die. But Cumberland was like, no, we can't. Let her die. We have to get a confession out of her. We have to prove that it isn't the Lord Bishop's child. Yeah, I liked that line. He's like, she must confess it's the devil's child, not the Lord Bishop's. <laughs> you know what's funny is they show Jeff Wilkins' face when he's like, I want a confession. And he's just like, motherfucker. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because on some level, you know, you got to know it's not coming, that confession. Some people are just that strong-willed, and it's like, what more can you do? Is this all for nothing? <laughs> right. Cumberland becomes way more hostile towards the prisoners. He's denying them water, demanding they be tortured harder. We see the young Baron again, and he has one of his hands locked in the thumbscrew. Did you notice that? <laughs> yeah, I noticed that. More importantly, they continue to work over this dude's ass, because they light a fire. If the panel earlier wasn't enough, they literally light a fire under his ass. <laughs> <laughs> They're just roasting his twig and berries, dude. Oh, it's brutal. I want to know where I get one of those chairs with the wide opening. Ikea, huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. We then get this scene where the advocate, Jeff Wilkins, and a few others overhear some kids in town talking about magic. And they end up chasing one of the kids to a home hosting a puppet show. And these ignoramuses take the puppeteering for some form of devilish magic and have the couple <laughs> arrested. Yeah, but before they can get arrested, the wife of the puppeteer... Who is a smoke show, let me tell you. <laughs> you thought Vanessa was good looking, man, this puppeteer chick, woo! <laughs> but anyway, continue. <laughs> Yeah, this female puppeteer, the wife, she tackles the advocate and is on top of him. And I really like here that Jeff, the men are about to save the advocate here, but Jeff Wilkins is like, nah, leave him be. Yeah, just let this, let this play out. <laughs> yeah, and then she takes that devil marking tool and sticks it in his eye. And I really love the psychedelic colors that show up when uh, he gets stabbed and yeah. we just see his eye pool of blood. It's, it's great. It's really good. It's definitely the best part of this scene and he's screaming for a good 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> we then see this poor puppeteer though, the man, strapped to a chair under a dripping machine, clearly being driven mad by the water torture. As we see a bald spot on his head where droplets of water just continuously fall. Some classic, classic Chinese water torture here. Very inventive. One of the more <laughs> creative instruments of torture demonstrated in the film, I will say. We see this guy periodically from here on out, and they do a great job of illustrating his descent into madness due to this <laughs> relentless dripping torture. Yeah, he always looks a little bit more crazy than the last time you saw him. I love when Jeff Wilkins, you see him smile and open the door, but he knows he hasn't broken him yet. He closes the door again. Well, he's not confessing. And we even get POV <laughs> shots and they're getting blurrier and blurrier and each drop is just rattling his sight. <laughs> <laughs> I think I would lose it. I don't think I could stomach that torture there. Well, it's 
got to be one of the most damaging because it's largely psychological. The worst torture, I think. Yeah, I mean, can you even recover from that? <laughs> every drop of water, every leaky sink from there on out, you're always thinking about that torture. Ugh, giving me shivers, dude. We finally see Christian confront Lord Cumberland on the murder of Albino, and the Lord tells Christian he told him not to idolize him, and he reminds Christian that he told them they were going down a difficult path and that many innocent people would die. And this causes Christian to question, well then, where lies safety? And Lord Cumberland informs him that it doesn't. Not for him. Not for you. There is no safety. And it's probably the most truthful thing he says in the entire film. It's almost prophetic, wouldn't you say? Yeah, no, that uh, fits with the themes of this movie quite well. Not long after that conversation, the puppet fiasco is brought to Cumberland's attention. And he speaks with the wife before returning to his quarters. And he openly admits to knowing they're innocent and that his men are simply stupid, but informs Christian that they must be executed for witchcraft. When Christian questions him why, he basically admits it to save face. There's an indictment and innocence be damned. They have no choice but to carry out the sentence. And this is really the final straw for Christian. Yeah, again, these men in power are doing everything they can to make sure that they stay in power. And whether that means abusing people or killing innocents in order to not show weakness or indecisiveness, then it must be done. And yeah, this is really where Christian finally sees the light and sees the evil that Cumberland is doing. There's a great line where Cumberland tells Christian, if they're innocent, they'll die as martyrs. And Christian says, if they're martyrs, what does that make you? (laughs) <laughs> and I really love that. Yeah, it's such a genius line. It just puts uh, people like Albino and Cumberland. It, you're supposed to be serving God and you're just murdering people for power. Horrible. We see the young Baron being tortured as Christian sees it upon himself to release Vanessa from the cell. And he sneaks her out of the castle, but he decides to return. And Vanessa pleads with him to flee with her, but he tells her he must save the Baron. We get a really strange impotence-laden rape sequence as Lord Cumberland attempts to rape the puppeteer's wife, but I don't think he was able to get it up. I think he was just rubbing on her. (laughs) I don't know if he was able to get it out, first of all. (laughs) We also get a strange scene of the executioner, and he's got the puppeteering apparatus on a bunny rabbit. (laughs) Like making its ears twitch. He really thought it was going to come to life and start talking. (laughs) (laughs) We see Christian attempt to help the young Baron escape the castle, but he gets cut off by some guards in Lord Cumberland, and he really calls Cumberland out on his bullshit here, and Cumberland questions where Vanessa has escaped to, and then Cumberland reminds Christian what he told him about where safety lies, or more importantly, where it doesn't. So Christian is imprisoned, but we cut to a scene where Vanessa has returned to the inn, and she's working the townsfolk into a frenzy. She convinces them to storm the castle and kill Lord Cumberland and all the cronies. A good old mob. You love to see it. Oh yeah. A guard informs Lord Cumberland of the impending siege, and Cumberland's like, Get my carriage, you fool. (laughs) (laughs) I'm getting the fuck out of here. He then orders the guards to go into town and kill anybody who dares stand against him and prepare my coach, like I said. (laughs) But (laughs) it just shows what a coward Cumberland is. But there are not nearly enough men to hold this castle because the townsfolk quickly storm this castle and get rid of anybody in their way. Throwing them off balconies, throwing them off bridges. Beating them to death. I love the plethora of pitchforks, too. (laughs) (laughs) You gotta have a pitchfork in an angry mob. Definitely. We also see in the courtyard of the castle, though, that they were planning to execute the young baron and the wife of the puppeteer. And you know, it's funny, because remember how we talked about at the beginning of the movie, we could overhear townsfolk talking? And one of the things they said was Jeff Wilkins is a shitty executioner. And we see him go to behead the Baron, and it does look like he just 
chops him right in the head, doesn't it? He missed the neck. He just splattered the cranium. Ugh. I don't want to think about it. <laughs> yeah, it was rough. It's a tragic end to the Baron story. But the mob does manage to save my busty blonde. <laughs> it is sad to see the poor Baron go because you did want him to make it out alive, but... Yeah, there's a great bit where the mob overwhelms the executioner and we see Jeff Wilkins get his legs cut off below the knee with his own sword. <laughs> Brutal stuff. And we'll see his stab-riddled corpse on the ground later. But I do wish we had seen some more violence inflicted upon him. I know he's just a pawn, but he knew what he was doing. He deserves what he gets. Yeah, I do wish we got some uh, better leg action there. Yeah, it's almost like his boot just falls over. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> I know you just put a paper towel roll in a boot, okay? <laughs> <laughs> the mob releases the prisoners, including Christian, as Lord Cumberland sneaks around the castle in a bid to escape the mob. And we see the castle getting ransacked at this point. But wouldn't you know it, we also see Lord Cumberland escape. Yeah, I like when Cumberland is... You know, trying to find a safe way out of this castle. And all the townspeople spot him. And he throws his uh, pimp cane into the crowd and <laughs> spears someone in the shoulder. Yeah, there's one unfortunate townsfolk who just gets it. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Cumberland, he jumps out the window and lands by his coach. And Cumberland is gone now. All that's left is Christian here. Yeah, it really sucks that Cumberland gets away, but it's fitting to this end. As we're seeing in this sequence, violence begets violence, and injustice begets injustice, because who does the mob grab? At the behest of the advocate, for some ungodly reason, the crowd turns on Christian, and they take him out to a field and string him up where the advocate uses this iron loop of spikes that can be tightened around a person's midsection to kill him. We see Vanessa trying to make her way to the castle when we hear the screams of Christian just echoing through the fields, and we see him kicking and squirming as he's pierced through his abdomen, side, and back. And Christian dies just as Vanessa arrives, and the mob begins to leave as she cries out for her love and wraps herself around him. And that's the end of our movie such a sad ending to see christian go but in a way he had to be the mortar for all this sin that we saw but in my head christian's up there with jesus just chilling <laughs> rest in peace christian udo we will see you again so danny did you like this movie sean i think this movie is wonderful and i'll keep it short but history was never my favorite subject in school. For some reason, you just couldn't get me to care about the history of man and where we came from. And this extended to media as well, as I was never really into period piece movies or historical video games. But for some reason, when you take a historical setting and you mix it with horror, for me, it just works. Ravenous might be my favorite film we've ever done on this show. It instantly made my top list of favorite films. And Mark of the Devil is just as fantastic. And I think it fits that same mold. And so maybe it's not the subject matter of it being historical. Maybe it's how you interact with it personally. Awesome, man. Glad to hear it. I really wasn't sure if you were going to like this one or not. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, every time you say you don't know if I'm going to like it or not, usually I come out at the other end uh, and really enjoying it. But yeah, I think this movie's great. It's well acted. It's got great themes of, about men in power and taking their righteousness of God too far. And it's a wonderful film. You should definitely check it out if you haven't seen it. And one more thing I'll say, I really love just the set design. Like they filmed it in a real castle and it just looks great like everything looks lived in cool man yeah it's an awesome looking movie it's a well-made movie it's don't let the exploitation label fool you this is a very well done movie yeah the exploitation 
a gimmick of the movie. I feel like it doesn't do it a disservice, but I feel like you hear that and you think less of it. And I think this movie's great. I think it's just an uh, underrated classic in my, in my eyes. It's just a good story. Like I said, I like uh, the themes going on here. Cool. Well, that was Mark of the Devil. All we've got left to do now is favorite kill and favorite scene. But we're going to add a little caveat here because there really isn't much in the way of traditional kills here. Sure, we get a few, but mostly we witness executions. And I think it would be a bit morbid to pick a favorite out of one of those. We are morbid enough, however, to pick a favorite torture device or scene. One perhaps that made us squirm more than the others, or one we just happened to like. So Danny, what did you choose? Well, my favorite torture... <laughs> so, <laughs> such a weird sentence, but... uh. Yeah, what you asked me, you know, let's do favorite torture because there's not much in the way of, I mean, there are kills, but it's not like a typical horror film type of kill. I was like, torture? Like, I don't know if I'm going to find one that I'll really care about. But I saw this one and I knew instantly. I was like, that's my pick. And it's got to be the water torture, the drip bucket, whatever you want to call it. Nice, nice. Like I said earlier. It has this psychological aspect that I think is a lot scarier when you think about it. You know, you're just stuck in this chair with this random bead of water dripping on you, and you're just left there alone. And we see the puppeteer just getting crazier and crazier, and I love the (laughs) POV shots of him looking at Jeff Wilkins, like smirk, and then just close the door on him. And this dude's in the dark alone. just. Dealing with this drip, drip, drip. Yeah, that's the one I think about. You know, say what you will about the physical torture, but I think the mental torture is more evil. (laughs) Well done. Yeah, man, it's a it's a good one and very inventive, very well filmed. So great choice. So Sean, give it to me. What's your favorite torture scene? (laughs) Well, you know, torture is my wheelhouse, so Now, for me, it goes no further than the thumbscrews. All of the torture sequences are shocking to watch and painful to look at. I'm sure there are worse tortures present in the film, but for me, there is just nothing worse than the thumbscrews. How's she going to ever play video games? (laughs) It's that just that blood shot. (laughs) Yes. Just the grape shot. It really is. It's called the grape shot. (laughs) Oh, it I'm really, gonna. it's like the icing. It's the icing on the scene. It really is. <laughs> yeah. The first time we see him in action and we get that shot of Jeff Wilkins just straining as he's trying to tighten the bolt. And then we see that gush of blood or goosh of blood, however you want to put it. But her thumb just <laughs> squished. Her thumb was just squished like a grape. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing in the movie makes me squirm more than that. So there you have it. <laughs> Good choice. I agree. It's uh, that's one of the worst tortures in the, in the film. And yeah, that that blood splatter just makes it. So how about a favorite scene, Danny? Well, my favorite scene, it's got to be Albino calling out Cumberland slash Albino's death or murder. Because We're on the same page here. <laughs> well, the reason I love this scene, here are two of the most evil men in this film talking with each other. And what puts Albino above Cumberland in my book is that Albino doesn't bullshit. He knows what he is and he fully admits to it. Even the entire town knows what Albino is and just knows he uses his power for his own means. They know he isn't truly a man of God, and Albino knows Cumberland is exactly like him. And here's Cumberland, who has this facade of being a man of God and doing it for justice and to serve his true love of God and his faith. But Albino just sees through it and throws it in his face. And he's like, dude, me and you, we're the same. And it clearly upsets Cumberland. I think it cuts him deeper than anything in the film here. Especially when he gets called impotent and seeing Cumberland 
strangle albino is great and yeah we talk about that shield spiraling on the floor and making the noise and then we see albino's life get strangled away a due to a great villain in a film awesome yeah that's my choice too and i'll say basically what you said in a few different ways because this film is painted with villainy and the best villains are ones who are capable of making you hate them. And we get not one, but two incredible villains in Albino and Lord Cumberland. And as much as I dislike them, I think they're so well acted and so well defined that I can't help but enjoy them when they're on screen. They're definitely my favorite characters in the movie. Uh, I agree. So without a doubt, my favorite scene is this too. (laughs) Yeah, it's just great seeing these two powerhouses go at it. Yeah, like we've already said, this movie speaks to some ugly truths, and we see those truths come spilling out here. The politics of man, power, and corruption, and the ugly consequences of it all. It consumes both of these men, and the one on the lower platform pays for it with his life. Plus, yeah, the shot of the shield rattling, the sound, the audio. Great shot. I just... Love Cumberland's eyes lighting up every time he hears the word impotent. <laughs> it's fucking classic. And hey, the, the scene ends with a beautiful stinger of Christian was there the whole time, just in the hallway, seeing mommy and daddy fight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Great stuff. Well, that was Mark of the Devil. Hope you enjoyed listening to us. We sure enjoyed talking about it. We definitely did, and it's been a great January, and we have an amazing, amazing lineup planned in February. We're going to have a selection for Black History Month, as well as a Valentine's special. So get ready. If you aren't denounced as a witch and burn on the stake, you're going to miss it. So mind your P's and Q's, folks. (laughs) Grab your lover. Make sure they're not a witch and listen to some fraternity. We'll be here, waiting for you. See you next time, everyone. Good night.